Hi, everyone. Uh, this is going to be a topic where I'm hopeful to hear from those listening what your response is about the proposal I'm going to suggest here. I'm going to ask this question. Is it time to eject the apostle of hate from all Bibles? Now, eject, I put in quotes because you can eject him by even leaving him there, but putting him in a separate section and using a nice divider that indicates why you're putting him in this separate section and you have a separate preface what explains why he's in this designated uh, category outside the inspired portion of canon and one of the things as i go over all this i want us to think about what jesus said do unto others as you would have them do unto you because when i show you the quote from paul in the next slide you ask yourself if this was about your ethnic group that you come from let's say you're uh, british anglo-saxon what if it said Anglo-Saxon instead of the word Jew? What if it said uh, Italians instead of Jew? What if it said black people instead of Jew? What if it said Armenians <laughs> instead of Jew? What if it said people from South Africa instead of Jews? So all I'm saying is if you knew there was a book that claimed to be the word of God and one of these people said something that was horrific about you as a group that is unjustified, evil, and pernicious, and led and was used, and I will show you later, this, this verse was, this message was in Luther. He taught from this a lesson. You'll see what his lesson was. And this lesson was followed to a T by the Nazi party. I'm gonna, I'm gonna play for you some information there so you can see uh, how this inspired the German people to, to cleanse their culture. And that's just simply the way we, they, they may have thought. But, but by a campaign of surreptitious uh, uh, SS camps where they put them in ovens alive and, and burn them to death. Our execution campaign that was maintained right during the middle of the war and even up to the end of the war. This is how priority this was for them. Anyway, so let's begin. It's important that we look at this verse. It's 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 14, 16. I call Paul the apostle of hate. And you'll see why. For you, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in, did, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For you also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are enemies of all people. Some translated contrary to all men, same idea enemies of all people isv forbidding us to speak the gentile to the gentiles that they might be saved and then paul's going to put a curse on them right next and right after that to fill up their sins always for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost so he is gleeful if they suffer that's what he wants that they should suffer for having resisted him and he's clearly an apostate, and they have a duty to resist an apostate. Someone who says the law is given by angels who are weak and beggarly celestial beings. That's Galatians 3, 9, 3 19 and uh, Galatians 4, chapter 9. They have a duty. And we'll show you how that duty to, to oppose Paul as an apostate was mandatory and was followed by our early church and by the Ebion. And, and they were actually, uh, the early church held him to be an apostate. And that's been hidden from us. And we finally found something that was really remarkable this past year. And the that's the Bishop of Milan telling us about this uh, determination by the original 12 or by the original apostles uh, that Jesus had appointed while he was here. And the new apostle Matthias that was appointed at in Acts 1. So that, that group excluded Paul on the basis that he was a false apostle and taught falsely on both circumcision and Sabbath. Now, here's, here's what you might see if you just cut this down to what the key evil is. The Jews have persecuted us, and they please not God and are the enemies of all people who, by opposing me, basically saying, fill up their sins always, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. What if it said the Italians have persecuted us, and they please not God and are enemies of all people who, by opposing me, fill up their sins always, for the wrath of God has come upon them to the uttermost. What if people started taking this serious in later centuries and said, hey, you know, the 
the Italians have persecuted uh, Paul and they're the enemies of all people. That's never changed. That's a word of God. We have to treat them as enemies of mankind. Let's go eradicate them. That's going to solve our, all of our problems. What if it said the British have persecuted us and they please not God and are enemies of all people who by opposing me fill up their sins always for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. Would you want to be seeing people handing out a Bible like this anywhere? Would you? Would you want to become a, a Christian if you were British and it said the British people are evil beyond means? They're the enemies of all people. Would you do unto others as you would have them do unto you? Look at this Bible and remove this man from the word of God because he could not possibly be speaking the word of God. And we're going to show you real quickly that in this episode. Here's what is a watershed moment for me this past year, this discovery of this work and, and really uh, studying it carefully and finding the original uh, Latin this year. Bishop of Milan, Ambrose, around 366, he writes, the Jewish believers who never list, this is his in, in his commentary, he's, he's still pro-Paul, just so you know, in this passage. It's 1 Corinthians 9, verse 2, where Paul says, some don't believe I'm an apostle, but you, my believers in, Corinthian, in Cor Corinth, you are the evidence of my apostleship because you've seen the sign of wonders and so on and so forth which by the way, Jesus says clearly in, in Matthew 7, 21, 23, if you're an apostate, if you teach anomia, lawlessness is how it's usually translated, but it's the word apostasy in Greek also. has It's a synonym, anomia, who, you who teach anomia. You can do signs and wonders and all these things and cast out demons, but I'm going to tell you on the day I come for you, I'm going to tell you I never knew you. Anyway, let's listen to this. The Jewish believers, Ambrose writes, Bishop of Milan, the Jewish believers who nevertheless continue to observe the law of Moses deny that Paul was an apostle because he taught that it was no longer necessary to be circumcised or observe the Sabbath. Even the other apostles thought that he was teaching something different because of this, and they denied he was an apostle. But to the Corinthians, Paul was an apostle because they had seen the signs of God's power in him. All right, so I did find this work of uh, Mr. Meeks from some time uh, probably around 2018-19, and so it was just a little quote of it, and I didn't go uh, right away and get the, buy the book that had this content in it. He was citing here from uh, Mr. Bray, first, first and Second Corinthians, until much later. So Mr. Bray made a translation in 1999, and I got that finally. But uh, there's some problems we have with that. I'll show you. So this is uh, Mr. Bray translated from the CSEL. So I could not find that. That's in the uh, some university up in Northern California. Could not find it here in Southern California. So I went online and found it in Latin, uh, equally in Latin, in another book called Patrologia. And guess what words are missing in the translation that uh, Mr. Bray used? Well, very important words. So let's listen to, well, the words he left out are, this finding that Paul was a false apostle was because the scandal caused them, the apostles, to withdraw themselves from him, Paul. There you have it. There's a scandal, and they withdraw themselves from him. So something went wrong. And in Galatians 2.11, Ambrose makes another comment on this, and he calls it a scandal again, where this there was this division. And that's when Paul uh, dressed down Peter and claimed that Peter did something wrong, not eating uh, with the Gentiles, who, if you hear the other side of the story, it's that they were eating meat sacrificed to idols, and you'll hear that in the Clementine homilies through even Rufinus's corruptions to that text. But so the patrologie is, it seems to me, I can't tell, uh, it, it'll say something about monumentum catholici traditions. It could be that they are simply Protestants who are relying upon. Catholic text. So I believe there's no doubt that this is the same way it reads in the CSEL that uh, Mr. Meeks uh, cites as a source for Mr. Bray's work. And so I don't understand why Mr. Bray missed these important words, but it can happen by accident. I'm sure it's always a possibility, but it's very convenient. These words are missing. Okay. And you want to see what it looks like in Latin. These are the words, propter scandal, mavac, disemantalibus. All right. Now, Let's look at uh, the findings of the early church that back up what Bishop Ambrose said. So here we have a statement from 1891. See down here at the bottom, 1891. And this is before the Ebion writings were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls and that the, the Ebion had to be readjusted to be a group that didn't even exist in the first, or <laughs> first century. Instead, they are the name of the apostolic church. Even Jerome said so when Paul said, I, I was told to remember the poor at Jerusalem 
And and Jerome says, well, what he's referring to is the name of the apostolic church was the Evian. I digress. Anyway, so this is Ulharn in 1891 saying before there's any controversy how old they were. He makes it very clear in the Religious Encyclopedia or Dictionary, Biblical Historical Doctrine, edited by Philip Schaff, the person who edited all the anti and post Nicene uh, texts and is considered a giant of, of uh, theological importance. Volume two, page 684, I have a PDF link. We read, quote, Ebionites, the designation was at first like Nazarene to a common name for all Christians. At first means at the beginning of Christianity, this existed. It derived from the Hebrew Ebion, the word for poor. Now, what about, what did the poor do? In, 18, in 180 AD, Iranian Bishop of Gaul said about the Ebionites. Now, that, this is looking back in time to records from the earliest church that Paul was determined to be something. Those who are called Ebionites use the gospel according to Matthew only and repudiate the apostle Paul, maintaining that he was an apostate from the law. This is in Against Heresies 1.26. You can find it in any volume. The Ebionites uh, were also said by Eusebius to have made this determination. He says this, and again, he's a church historian who's going all the way back to the beginning. And he writes in Ecclesiastical History 3.27 about the Ebionites. These men, the Ebionites, moreover, thought that it was necessary to reject all the epistles of the Apostle Paul, whom they call an apostate from the law, and they used only the so-called gospel according to the Hebrews by Apostle Matthew, and made small account of the rest. But just for the record, Arrhenius says that they did use the gospel of Luke, and they were proved that. And that makes sense because now Professor Edwards has demonstrated that the Gospel of Luke is a obvious translation of the Gospel of the Hebrew Matthew. And so Luke must have known Hebrew translated into Greek. That doesn't mean there haven't been corruption since then. It's just simply a fact that that's what, why they likely accepted it. And here's uh, Professor Dunn acknowledging this, a very famous professor, by the way. He writes this in the Cambridge Companion to St. Paul, Cambridge University Press, 2003, at page two. He says the most direct, and he says heirs, no, the direct Jewish Christian groupings within the earliest Christianity regarded Paul as the great apostate and arch enemy. And he cites Epistolae Petrae, and that is a work uh, that is uh, a part of the Clementine homilies, 2.3. We've we've quoted it in our one of our prior series that we called it the letter of Peter to James, and then the Clementine homilies, 17, uh, homily 17 is the key one if you want to always look at the uh, trial of Paul, if, if you will. 17 verses 18 to 19. When did the Ebionite investigation begin on Paul's apostasy? In Acts 21, 21, we see it directly, my friends. Paul's asked a question by James. The bishop of Jerusalem tells Paul that he has heard that Paul is guilty of apostasia. Do you see that? Apostasia? But you are not le- you're, you're not adult enough to have them translated correctly into a cognate word. So cognate word means the word apostasy in Greek sounds exactly like apostasy in English, and they mean the same thing. Why wouldn't you use the same word so we would hear the significance of this charge? Oh, they change it into the, we've heard that you forsake Moses. No, you've an apostate against Moses. And that's the crime that eventually leads to the apostles, the 12 and or the remaining apostles at the time of uh, Paul's doing these deeds and James still leading them, and they determine Paul is a false apostle. That is the Greek word. However, it is never translated in its proper transliterated form in English, the word apostasy, except in Young's literal translation. So one Bible does it right, doesn't hide it from you, and that's Acts 21.21 of the Young's literal translation. Now, what does this word come from, and where does it relate into the law? The related word apostate means one is suspected of being guilty of violating Deuteronomy 13.1-5, known as the punishment of apostates passage. Please note again that Young's literal is virtually alone among Protestant Bibles that properly translates Deuteronomy 13.5 using the term apostasy. See how you would connect the dots if you could hear the word, but you're not adult enough, apparently, to know what it really says. So that's Deuteronomy 13.5 in the Young's literal translation. Can you see you could draw a line right between Acts 21 and 21 and Deuteronomy 13.5 if you had the words correctly, but you're not allowed to know what's going on. But that I digress. Finally, a special note is the response of the editors of the Jewish Encyclopedia in 1912, Volume 2 at 13. You could click that on our online page. When they put these facts together, you can hear their shock when they found the, the, this in the pages of the Christian Bible. In their article entitled Apostasy, we read, 
It is a remarkable fact in the history of Christianity that according to Acts 21, verse 21, Paul was accused before the Council of James of apostasy from the law of Moses, for which reason the early Christians, the Ebonites, repudiated the apostle Paul, maintaining he was an apostate from the law, erroneous against heresies. He's citing 136. So the Jewish encyclopedia is putting two and two together. That's when it happened. After this, this one thing led to the next, and eventually they figured it out. And they, and they were they were going after him to find out if he was an apostate. And they pushed him. They gave him a task to do there that he did, that he had to obey the law, uh, do an as right vow. But that eventually they didn't trust him, and they kept going after him, obviously. And they found out he was really an apostate. They probably got one of his writings. And whether you know it or not, it's actually all memorialized right there in the words of Jesus in Re Revelation chapter 2. You're going to go, why, do, why doesn't he use the name of Paul? Uh, you know what? That's a good question. Why doesn't he? Do you think there might be a test from God? If you read Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 5, he actually says, I send, I allow false prophets to test you to see whether you love me with your whole heart, mind, and soul. So what if Jesus just said, uh, you know, Paul, I reject him. No, 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 no. God wants you to be tested. So that Paul is a test. And that's why we're going to recommend, we are going to, I'm going to uh, urge us to eject Paul from true canon divide them off. If we have a sense of what true canon is, we need to create a separate section just for Paul and label it appropriately. Let's say, for example, false apostle, the false apostle, or some other appropriate designation that people understand we're not claiming he's attached for purposes of, of you reading him for proof, but actually to pass the test of rejecting him and then give people that proof and evidence. And they, they can decide, well, no, I'm going to treat him as a true apostle. Well, it's he's still there for you to read if you want to fall into that pit. But but we are going to provide the new test the New Testament has to be revised to reflect that because again, would you want a Bible by Christian you, uh, Christians go around the world claiming that in there is this horrific statement about Italians that they're the enemies of all mankind or Polish people they're the enemies of all mankind. But we act like it's no big deal that it says Jews are the enemies of all mankind. We think it's no big deal. But eight million people were killed based on these passages. Clearly, were Luther said to do this. You have to know that, ladies and gentlemen. Luther definitely put his foot in his mouth, and that's what Hitler used. Directly, and I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you even a poster about Luther and Hitler that they use this propaganda. But I digress. So let's read what Renan says about half what happens in, in uh, Revelation. Ernest Renan, a Christian scholar, uh, basically is unaffiliated with Protestantism or Catholicism, and he's an individual who just studies theology and writes books. And very popular. He was French, and everybody loves his works. And they were internationally renowned, translated into English, and read here and as well in Europe. A Christian scholar and defender of Paul, and, and some people have this wrong idea, when he wrote this, up to page 300, he was completely defending Paul. But later, at the book, he seemed to flip. He, no, he did flip. And he said, Paul is a, you know what? In second thought, Paul is a hidden rock that has caused many to stumble. And he basically reverses. You're going to see he's going to vilify the church in the opening paragraph here. So let me read this. Let me get this out of the way here. In St. Paul, G.W. Carlton, 1869 to 20, explains why Revelation is anti-Pauline, which he ascribes to irrational hatred by Apostle John. The second and third chapters of the Apocalypse, meaning Revelation, written in 68 AD, are a cry of hatred against Paul and his friends. This church of Ephesus is praised for having tried those who say they are apostles and are not, for having found them liars. Now I'm going to just stop right there. Do you realize he's inciting hatred against our apostles? Renan is at first because he's taking the side of Paul. So again, this hate, Paul, ha everybody who's opposed to Paul, t Paul teaches to hate them. So that, if you re pay attention to what Paul's saying is the Jews oppose me, that's what he's saying in First Thessalonians, and that means they're an enemy of all mankind. So you can see Renan is playing on that because at this point in time, he hasn't had his conversion moment, which is gonna come at page 300 plus. We'll get to uh, that. We're not gonna deal with that here today, but you can see it in the famous quotes of uh, Renan. With two episodes on that. I'm going to skip over a few things here. But I have a few things against you, the divine voice says to Pergamos, that's Jesus, says to Pergamos, because thou has there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam to eat things sacrificed to idols. And he, he references that clearly Paul permits eating meat sacrificed to idols in 1 Corinthians 8 and 1 Corinthians 10. No question about it. Anyway, 
And because of that, the Christian professor Ezra Palmer Gould, a pro-Paul person, and who doesn't like the fact Revelation sounds is what it is, he says this in his book called Biblical Theology in the New Testament, Macmillan, 1900, he unhappily admits, quote, the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation written by Apostle John represents an unqualified opposition to Paul. The Apocalypse is anti-Pauline, page 125. Revelation is a writing distinctly anti-Pauline, page 131. I'm not going to go through it here with all the proof, but actually Jesus in that pa in that uh, passage too, in the reference to Thyatira, is actually quoting something Paul uses in First Corinthians chapter two, saying, "I'm going to teach you of the depths of God, de the bate of God," and Jesus uh, ridicules that in the chapter two, where he says, "Those people who are teaching you to eat meat sacrifice idols, like Paul in First Corinthians eight and ten, he's referring implicitly to First Corinthians two, and he says those are teaching you the bate, the depths of Satan." Just so you know. And scholars agree that seems to be a possibility, but I would say it's a, it, when you read the whole context about these people who claim to the Ephesians, they were uh, true apostles, they said they were apostles, but you found them false, Jesus commending them, you see. And that is, my opinion, is a reference back to this trial the, the apostles put Paul under and found him a false apostle that who? Bishop Ambrose says happened. Now, just want to show you, now we're going to take a, a deep dive into something that shows you unequivocally Paul has a completely skewed idea of the important role of Jews in the New Covenant. And, and he excludes them completely when that's preposterous. Okay, so now uh, many Christians don't even know what the New Covenant means because we're never told to read the prophecy of a new covenant and it's in jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 33 yahweh told us there that the quote new covenant was based on quote inscribing the law the torah on our hearts you need to read it in the hebrew go to the inner linear and you'll see the word torah of course christian bibles often try to obscure what that is and they'll use different names the teaching or they'll use other words than the torah but that's what it says and then it says the new covenant was uh, is with judah and israel and those you have to know are the southern and the northern kingdom at that time it had been split in two and so god is talking about bringing them back and, and wooing them back as a wife so this is all about uh, the jews not not gentiles now it doesn't mean we're excluded but just just as the uh, land of israel was a place where sojourners foreigners were always welcome to join and would have particip participatory rights in various thing that we would have benefits from coming into their country so that didn't go away the torah emphatically has all that it's very pro uh, sojourner to come into their country and you get the tithe to support you for a while and there there's definitely uh that kind of thing so let's go on now what does Paul say happened to the Jews in the New Testament? Are they still the covenant partners of God? Absolutely not. Galatians 4 verse 22, Paul said that the Jews of Jerusalem no longer correspond to the sons of Israel, but instead to the sons, uh, son Ishmael of Hagar. This is uh, Abraham had two, two, a wife and a, I don't want to call her, uh, she was a maid servant and the wife couldn't have kids. So Apparently, this was a tolerable in those days. He could have uh, relations with his maid and with his wife's permission, apparently. And she had a son called Ishmael. And so, but he doesn't have full rights because it's not a true marriage. It's a whatever it is. And so Abraham, basically, uh, his only true children are through Sarah that are completely legitimate. And the children from Ishmael are essentially illegitimate still even though it's permissible in a sort of loose sense so what he's saying in galatians 4 22 and following he's saying the jews are no longer the legitimate children of sarah that they were the illegitimate children of hagar please read this stuff sometimes people read this stuff it's just poison to the soul if you don't understand what you're ingesting without saying hey you should be getting ill as you read this stuff and he says they're thrown out into the desert to wander like Ishmael. Ishmael was, uh, and, and Hagar were told by Abraham, you know, you have to go off out of here. My wife and I don't want to have this participation with you anymore. So that's that's uh, the way it worked. But Paul switched gears, switched roles, and now Sarah's children are just you and me, or, you know, excuse me, I should be more modest here. Whoever has faith alone in Jesus is probably what Paul means. 
uh, and and uh, believes in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, which I do, of course. So I supposedly I supposedly must be saved according to Paul, right? So uh, anyway, this is a complete evisceration of this prophecy. The new covenant is no longer with the Jewish people. In fact, they don't even exist. There's no more Jew or Gentile. That's what Paul says. What is this? What is this prophecy? Does he not? He does not know the Bible. I really believe he doesn't know the Bible because you could never say what he's saying here in Galatians 4, 2, 22. Can't, can't, because it's the prophecy, prophecy of reuniting Israel. The Jewish people are divided in two kingdoms. They're going to be reunited and he's going to woo. Now, Judah had never uh, been unfaithful, but Israel, the northern kingdoms had been unfaithful and now god was going to bring her back as a wife uh again and so there was sort of this uh, uh, metaphors of that but definitely it's the jewish people and he's paul saying there's no more jew or gentile and he's saying that, that the jews are really parallel to these uh, uh, the children of hagar which was cast out and thrown into the desert and now we the the gentiles apparently are the ones or this group of uh, just people who follow Christ supposedly are basically all saved as if we're sons of Sarah. So we're all Jews or yeah, that seems to be what he's trying to say, right? Somehow we're, we're all derivative of Sarah now. now. We should see it that way. Let's put it that way. Eisenman is perhaps too kind when he says Paul's remarks in Galatians 4, 22 to 31, what I just told you about, contain a series of sometimes outrageous illusions. Outla outrageous isn't the word for it, everybody. Professor Eisenman, New Testament Code at 587. So obvious question, how could Paul be inspired by God in this when the same God said in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 and following, that he could never base a new covenant other than the law given Moses, right? That's It said that it would be based on the Torah put on our hearts or enter it with enter into it with any other people than the seed of Israel, the, the, the tribe of Judah and the other tribes of Israel. <laughs> Where is Paul coming from, everybody? And then just keep in mind what we're the objective here is we have a Bible that has somebody who's speaking such offensive words to denigrate the Jewish people that that it, it led to the you'll see. I'm going to, we'll get to that in a second here. So I've already told you about this passage. I'm not going to go over it again, but this is where uh, it all boils down to First Thessalonians 2, 14 to 16. My point being is that this, these kind of words, if it were about you in the Bible, you're an ethnic group, you would, you would never become a Christian. You would, you would never want your children to read this. You know, how could I, how could I, as an Italian parent, for example, or from her, Italian heritage, have my child read something that said that Italians are the enemies of all mankind? Come on. You would never want your child to read that. It just make them feel terrible about themselves. So that's going to happen. And um, so I want to bring up here just quickly again, we talked about Paul as a Rodian. You'll see why in a second. And uh, Romans 16, 11, Paul greets Herodian, my kinsman. Well, why am I bringing that up? Because he says here, the Jews killed the Lord Jesus. Well, that's actually wrong. It's not the Jews. It was Herod. And I, and I finally pieced this together because I realized what, it, it's important that Paul is an Herodian, that that's what Eisenman figured out, because clearly Paul says in Romans 16, 11, Herodion, which means little Herod in Greek, my kinsman, meaning my relative, means Paul is of the family of Herod. And that's very important to understand. Everything fits together now if you've got that in your head. And I also found this that Mr. Eisenman did not find, and I pat myself on the back. I'm just saying there's even more evidence that I think is conclusively important here. Where in Acts 13, 1, it says, Now there was in the church that was in Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. There is no comma there. There's no reason to pause. That is how Greek works. There's no comma because Greek is written in a style called scriptio continue. There's no punctuation. There's no spaces, punctuation, or different letters to distinguish words, phrases, or sentences. The, the, the text was written as a continuous string of letters with no spaces between words or paragraphs. The only punctuation of a horizontal stroke at the left edge of the column to mark main sentence breaks. The only way to decipher these texts was to read them aloud, even to oneself, to hear their syntactic structure. And if you do that, it's clear that Menaean had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Her Saul is a relative of Herod's. Herodion, in the, by his own admission, in his commentary, his, his statement in Romans 13. And here, Luke is telling us in Acts that Menaean grew up as a childhood friend of both Herod the Tetrarch, 
That is the same person who sent Jesus to his death with Pilate. And I'm going to show you that proves to me that that's what's going on here. And then I'm going to show you one more thing about the high priest. We'll get to that in a second here. And, uh, and and that the fact that Paul's an Herodian explains why Paul says, uh, "Let every soul be subject to the ruling authorities, for there's no power but but of God." This is Romans thirteen one. The powers that be are ordained by God. My goodness me! So Jesus was killed properly. Let's see what he says about that. Whoso therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God, and therefore they they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So if you disobey Pilate or you disobey Herod or any of these uh, creepy people. You're uh, you're subject to damnation. My goodness, who would that serve? What where? Who benefits from Paul's message here? Th this is higher than the law given by angels to a mediator who are weak and beggarly elements and teach Sabbath, and you should no longer do that. Why do you want to be in bondage again to the weak and beggarly uh, celestial beings? Paul has put the law way below the the ruling authority of the Herodians right here. He then says here, for rulers are not a terror to good works. Tell that to Jesus. But to the evil, tell that again to Jesus, please. It's almost like he's not thinking. He never processes it, you know, But because he's wed to the Herodian party. There's nothing to explain it other than that. It's so, it's so dominant in his mindset that it, he, it doesn't process that Jesus was killed by the, the Romans executing him under their law because he was a allegedly claiming he was a king. And that's that's not allowed. That's called sedition. Uh, every person must be so. Okay, so I just, uh, this is the Greek New Testament in Mouncey, and it's called governing authorities, not uh, well, the, uh, unto the powers, I think is how the King James had it. It's not telling you the truth of what's really going on there. Okay. Uh, whoever resists authority resists what God has decreed. Wow. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves, condemnation, damnation. Let's move on. But here's, here's uh, the important next. Okay, so just so you know, the high priest was appointed completely at this time by the Herodian family. And uh, so there were four tetrarchs ruling in Judea, and Herod Antipas was ruling over a section of the area of Galilee and three other provinces, areas in the Judea. And, but uh, he, the, that ruler, the Herod, the tetrarch Ant, known as Antipas, he was the one who sends Jesus to his death to Pilate. And you'll see how that happened. So Pilate speaks with Jesus. Uh, let's see here. King Herod, who ruled Galilee and a couple of other provinces, provinces within that. Uh, he was at Jerusalem at the time when this trial is happening. And so Pilate sends P Jesus back to Herod. Herod Antipas, this play boyhood friend of Paul. Do you get it now, by people? Boyhood friend of Paul. That's what it says in Acts 13. And uh, and then we have uh, this this whole thing goes on with Herod. How do they treat him? Herod and his soldiers treated Jesus contemptuously and mocked him. And after clothing him in his resplendent garb, he sent him back to Pilate. Herod used Christ as a toy, another obsequious courtier who might amuse him for a time. And uh, so that's important because that's if you're Pilate and you you sent him to to uh, Herod. And you were hoping he would make a ruling, and he doesn't. He sends it back to you. What do you think he wants? Herod thinks he's a king of the Jews, and so all the Herods think they're kings of the Jews, and they don't want any rival kings. So Pilate's going to have to do his job in the end. And uh, here's an article on anti-Semitism by Brayton, Brenton Deaconson and the Judaistic Paul, study of 1 Thessalonians 2, 14, 16, and he mentions this, a Pauline sympathizer, meaning someone who likes Paul, admits. Donald Hagner, Paul's quarrel with Judaism and anti-Semitism in early Christianity, 1993. And he calls 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 14 to 16, quote, the most notorious anti-Judaic passage in the Pauline cor corpus. In fact, it's the most it's the most notorious statement and probably it exceeds, exceeds what Hitler would say. That's really what it says. The Jews are the enemies of all mankind. I mean, that's like words to sing a song to Hitler. But I digress. Anyway, here's a couple of the passages. It literally means in Greek, the Jews oppose face to face every human being on earth. OK, uh, so you have here Jews uh, uh, are displeasing to God and are the enemies of all people. No exceptions. Uh, the Jews both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they please not God and are contrary to all men. KJV. Uh, all right. 
I can go into other factors here, um, but I'm going to keep moving fast. I want you to know that most Christians have no idea how that passage moved into the Hitler and got him uh, to use it, use that concept and teaching. How did it transmit? It transmitted through Luther. And this uh, author, William Scherer, wrote a classic 1,400-page tome, whom as a little boy, I read this passage as a young man, and I was like shocked. Uh, I had become a Christian. I'm going, how does this match with the Word of God? So it's a, one of the first things I questioned even about Protestantism, why we listen to Paul. So I did have a little, at 14 years old, 15 years old, when I first came, first came to Christian, I'm reading William Scherer's book, and I'm going, and I found this passage. So I remembered it forever after that. So I think I'm going to do a quiz on this episode, so please pay attention. It is difficult to understand, uh, Scherer, Scherer says, it is difficult to understand the behavior of most German Protestants in the first Nazi years unless one is aware of two things, their history and the influence of Martin Luther. At this point, Scherer writes in a footnote, to avoid any misunderstanding, it might be well to point out that the author is a Protestant. The great founder of Protestantism was both a passionate anti-Semite and a ferocious believer in absolute obedience to political authority. Ergo, Romans 13 supports that view. He wanted Germany rid of the Jews, and when they were sent away, he advised that they be deprived of, quote, all their cash and jewels and silver and gold. That's a quote from Luther. And furthermore, next quote of Luther, that their synagogues or their schools be set on fire, that their houses be broken up and destroyed, and that they be put under roof, a roof or stable like the gypsies in misery and captivity as they incessantly lament and complain to God about us. Advice that was literally followed four centuries later by Hitler, Goering, and Himmler. I just wanted to show you, I'm going to show you a poster of Luther that was used by Hitler. And this comes about in 1933 when Hitler takes uh, his first step in January 1933 to become chancellor. And it was basically a compromise situation. He wasn't very that popular, but due to various backdoor deals, he becomes legally the chancellor of uh, Germany on January 30, 1933. So that was the, the leading figure, the, not a president, but a chancellor. And look at this. This is not an article called Nazi Propaganda, Propaganda Depicting Martin Luther. And here is uh, Hitler's uh, influence. Basically, he's attributing his views to this man, because what does it say in that sign? That This is a Hitler poster from 1933. Hitler's fight and Luther's teaching are the best defense for the German people. That's what it says in German. So this is what he's fighting with. He's using Luther's views and that work in particular about putting the Jews into stables and, and t depriving them of all their possessions and treating them like animals. You know? So it had to start somewhere. Where did it start? It started with Paul. It started then in Luther and Luther to Hitler. It's not a long line. It's not a hard line to follow. And then uh, the Nazis used uh, Romans 13. I should have read that to you, that uh, Paul said uh, you have to obey the rulers. And if you don't, you're subject to damnation, regardless of what how, how evil they were. It doesn't matter. They're ordained by God. You got to do whatever they say. Now I'm going to play for you a small 43 second clip and then I'm going to quickly end it. So I'm trying to keep it short, but this is Adolf Hitler appealing to God almighty, the providence and that he claims almighty God is on his side. So listen to this. Just want to show you, you, you just have to understand that it's not someone who wants to kill 8 million Jews doesn't have to, uh, how can I put it? He can believe that God is on his side if he has someone like Paul in his head. So let's just listen to it. Und nur dann, wenn dieses ganze deutsche Volk zu so einer einzigen Opfergemeinschaft wird, dann allein können wir auch erwarten, dann können wir hoffen, dass uns die Vorsehung auch in der Zukunft wieder beistehen wird. Der Herrgott hat noch niemals einem Faulen geholfen. Er hilft auf keinem Feigen. Er hilft auf keinem Volk, das sich nicht selber helfen will. Hier gilt im Größten der Grundsatz, heute hilft dir selbst, dann wird der Herr Gott seine Hilfe dir nicht verweigern. So if we love our neighbor as ourselves, can you imagine if it said, from whatever country you come from, Hungary, Poland, Ukraine, 
England, Canada, that you're the enemy of all mankind. And this is not just somebody, somebody making an accusation. This is someone that the, a whole group, a spiritual community, 1 billion, if you include all the Catholics and the Protestants, that claim it's the word of God that all Jews are the enemy of all mankind. This, my friends, requires a solution to eradicate Paul from our Bibles. We have plenty of proof that that was what the early church did themselves. And by putting him back in the Bible, we set the stage for this crime that was committed just now. It's almost uh, uh, how many years ago? 1945, let's say it ended. So 55, another 20 years. Yeah, so it's like 75, 70, almost 80 years ago. But you, you, it's not going to go away. It'll come back. You know, the uh, the Inquisition happened in the 1500s, and then it stopped for a while, and then it came back in the 1600s, and then, you know, went away, and then you come back and you get the, and that was all anti-Jewish too, by the way. So people think, oh, well, you know, it's just, it'll go away, and then it won't never come back. No, Inquisition was killing tens of thousands of, of Jews in Spain, right? You hope you know that. And then, you know, that kind of died out, but then there were other program pogroms, they call them and other things. And then it died out. And then people think it's not going to come back, but it always comes back using the same passage. This passage of first Thessalonians is inimical to the safety of, of, of people who are being uh, denigrated allegedly by God almighty. But instead, it's just Paul. It's somebody who denigrates God's word. The law is given by angels through a mediator. Why, you know, why do you want to be subject to weak and beggarly celestial beings who gave it in the first place? So I'm just going to say we have to do something. We can't just sit around and let, let another Holocaust happen. You go, oh, you're just worrying about nothing. No, if it were you on the other side, you wouldn't do unto others as you would have them do to you, because if it was your ethnic group being skewered like that, would you want to have anything to do with a person who's a member of that church, that congreg that group, that theological group? No. And so I, really it's a, uh, it's uh, a, I think it has to be resolved somehow. So I'd be curious what other people think is a solution uh, to the, is the problem of Paul and, um, uh, and I have to ask those people who are wedded to Paul, how do you feel about this? Are you willing to tolerate this? And you believe it yourself that the Jews are the enemy of all mankind. Just let me know uh, in your comments. All right. God bless. Take care. Ciao. Bye.